In this lesson, we are going to look at the principle of operation of the pressure altimeter and how the pressure altimeter is calibrated. We will also look at the simple altimeter, the sensitive altimeter and the servo-assisted altimeter. The pressure altimeter can be thought of as a pressure gauge which senses change in static air pressure and, by means of calibration, expresses the change of static air pressure as a change in altitude. So in order to appreciate how the altimeter works, we first have to look at the atmosphere and how altitude affects static air pressure. In the atmosphere which surrounds the Earth, the static air pressure experienced at any point will depend on the weight of the air above that point. If we imagine a column of air extending vertically upwards from the Earth's surface to the outer limits of the atmosphere, it will be clear that the higher up the column we climb, the shorter the column of air above us becomes, and so the weight of air above us reduces. In other words, the greater the height, the lower the pressure. By measuring pressure, the altimeter measures height or altitude. Unfortunately, the relationship between pressure and altitude is not linear. Additionally, high and low pressure weather systems can produce significant air pressure changes for any given altitude. If we look at the isobar chart shown here, we can see that if we were to travel from the UK to Iceland at mean sea level, the air pressure above us will change from around 1036 millibars or hectopascals to approximately 996 millibars or hectopascals. The matter is further complicated because the rate at which temperature changes within the air will vary considerably and this affects the air pressure also. With all these variables in the atmosphere Calibration of the altimeter is a complex matter and it is necessary to assume an average or standard atmospheric condition from which to apply any necessary corrections. The atmospheric condition universally adopted as standard is known as the International Standard Atmosphere or ISA. ISA conditions assume the following. Firstly, that mean sea level pressure is 1013.25 millibars or hectopascals and the temperature is plus 15 degrees Celsius while the air density is 1225 grams per cubic meter. Secondly, that from mean sea level up to 36,090 feet or 11 kilometers, temperature is assumed to reduce by 1.98 degrees Celsius per thousand feet or 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Thirdly, that from 36,090 feet or 11 kilometers up to 65,617 feet or 20 kilometers, the temperature is constant at minus 56.5 degrees Celsius. And finally, from 65,617 feet or 20 kilometers up to 104,987 feet or 32 kilometers, temperature increases by 0 0.3 degrees Celsius per thousand feet or 1 degree Celsius per kilometer. On the basis of these assumptions, the pressure which corresponds to any given altitude in the ISA can be calculated and under laboratory conditions, any altimeter readout can be checked against the ISA calculated figures. Any discrepancies within accepted limits can be listed as instrument error over the operating range of the altimeter and can be recorded on a correction table for the altimeter. Before we move on to looking at how the altimeter works, something that will be apparent if we think about it is that if the altimeter is calibrated to ISA conditions, the altimeter can only indicate the correct altitude where ISA conditions exist. 
and as we have seen, atmospheric conditions vary considerably. The lesson on altimeter pressure settings deals with how we overcome this problem. Let's look at how the altimeter works then. In its simplest form, static pressure is fed into a sealed instrument case from the static source. Inside the instrument case is a partially evacuated capsule, or aneroid capsule. Expansion and contraction of the capsule is kept under control by a leaf spring, and the controlled movement is transmitted via a system of linkages to the pointer on the instrument dial. As altitude increases, the static pressure inside the instrument case decreases. The capsule expands, which causes the pointer to rotate and indicate an increase in altitude. In the descent, the capsule is compressed and the pointer moves in the opposite direction. The linkage incorporates a temperature compensating device to minimize errors caused by expansion and contraction of the linkage and changes in spring tension due to changes in the temperature of the mechanism. We can see the principle of the linkage mechanism in operation, although the actual arrangement is much more complex. The simple altimeter has a manual setting knob which is geared to the pointer. If this knob is used to set zero on the ground, we call the altimeter setting QFE, and we say that the altimeter indicates height. These terms will be explained in more detail in the next lesson. If we set the airfield distance above sea level when on the ground, we call the pressure setting QNH, and the altimeter indicates altitude. Again, we'll explain this in more detail later. The sensitive altimeter uses essentially the same principle of operation as the simple altimeter, but incorporates some additional refinements. The single aneroid capsule of the simple altimeter is replaced with a bank of two or sometimes three aneroid capsules. We can see two capsules represented diagrammatically here. The combination of capsules gives increased movement for changes in pressure, and this makes the instrument more sensitive to small changes in altitude. Accuracy is also improved by the use of jeweled bearings in the mechanical linkages, which reduces friction. As with the simple altimeter, a temperature compensating device is incorporated, which minimizes the errors caused by expansion and contraction in the linkages. Some sensitive altimeters incorporate vibrators, which help overcome friction and the inertia of the mechanical linkages. This assists in giving a faster response rate to altitude change. Looking at the sensitive altimeters illustrated on the screen, we can see that the more sophisticated mechanism of the sensitive altimeter enables the use of three pointers on the instrument dial. One pointer for tens of thousands of feet, one for thousands, and one for hundreds of feet. While this may initially be seen as advantageous, there is a major shortcoming here, in that the three-pointer system is easy to misread. Both the altimeters shown here are actually indicating 24,100 feet. If we look at the sensitive altimeter to the far right now, we can see that in this version of the instrument, a much clearer display is achieved by substituting two of the three pointers with a digital altitude readout. A single pointer is retained to indicate 1,000 feet per revolution and to provide a valuable indication of the rate of altitude change. This altimeter is also indicating 24,100 feet. Move the aircraft up and down and observe the different indications of altitude. The sensitive altimeter also incorporates a variable subscale, which can be manually controlled to set a required pressure datum. The relevance of this facility is discussed in the lesson on altimeter pressure settings. But let's take this opportunity 
to see how changing the altimeter subscale changes the indicated altitude. A further refinement of the pressure altimeter is the servo-assisted altimeter, which gives improved accuracy, particularly at high altitudes, where the change in air pressure is much smaller than at low altitudes for a given change in height. The principle of the servo-assisted altimeter is that direct mechanical linkage between the aneroid capsules and the pointer is replaced with an electromagnetic system. Minute movements of the capsules can be sensed by this system and the movements converted into electrical current by an electromagnetic pickoff. The electric current generated is amplified and used to drive a servo motor which rotates the pointer. We can see here in diagrammatic form how this is achieved. Movement of the capsules is transmitted to a pivoted bar, known as an I-bar. Opposite the I-bar is an E-shaped bar. As we can see, the E-bar has coils wound around each leg. The coils on the outer legs are wound in opposite directions, which causes them to be 180 degrees out of phase with each other. AC current is fed to the middle leg, which sets up an alternating magnetic field in the outer legs. Because the windings on the outer legs are 180 degrees out of phase with each other, when the gap between the I-bar and the legs of the E-bar is equidistant, the magnetic fields generated are equal and opposite and cancel each other out. No current will therefore flow in the circuit. When the capsules expand or contract with changes in altitude, they move the I-bar on its pivot, and the gap between the I-bar and E-bar will change. This causes an imbalance in the magnetic fields, and an electrical current will flow in the circuit. The current is amplified and fed to the servo motor, which drives the pointer. A worm drive and cam mechanism realigns the I-bar with the E-bar. Once realigned, equilibrium is restored and the altimeter indicates the correct altitude. In practice, the E-bar movement and the realignment can be considered to be a single continuous process. To recap then, we can say that the advantage of the servo-assisted altimeter are that it gives improved accuracy particularly at higher altitudes. Additional advantages are that friction and manufacturing imperfections in the mechanical gearing of a conventional altimeter are reduced and altitude sensing in electrical form is available as a central source of information for digital readouts and systems such as autopilot, flight data recorder and altitude warnings. This concludes the lesson. A summary of the main points to consider from the lesson follows. The pressure altimeter senses change in static pressure and by means of calibration expresses the change in static air pressure as a change in altitude. The greater the altitude, the lower the air pressure. High and low pressure weather systems produce air pressure changes at any altitude. An adopted standard atmospheric condition is required in order to calibrate the altimeter. The standard atmospheric pressure is the International Standard Atmosphere, ISA. The pressure altimeter consists of a sealed instrument case with a partially evacuated capsule or aneroid capsule inside. Static pressure is fed to the instrument case. As altitude increases, the static pressure decreases, and the aneroid capsule expands, causing a pointer on the altimeter dial to show an increase in altitude. The converse applies in the descent. The simple altimeter incorporates a manual pressure setting knob and a temperature compensating device in the linkages. The sensitive altimeter 
incorporates two or three aneroid capsules to increase sensitivity to small changes in altitude. In the sensitive altimeter, jeweled bearings are incorporated to reduce friction. In the sensitive altimeter, vibrators can be incorporated to overcome friction and the inertia of mechanical linkages. The sensitive altimeter allows the use of a three-pointer dial. However, it is easy to misread. The servo-assisted altimeter gives more rapid response and improved accuracy, particularly at high altitudes. The servo-assisted altimeter replaces mechanical linkages with an electromagnetic E and I bar system. In this lesson, we are going to remind ourselves of the basic principle behind the pressure altimeter and to appreciate its limitations as a measure of vertical distance. We will also look at altimeter settings and the reasons for using one rather than another. First, let's start with some basic definitions so that we use the correct terminology. Altitude, when used on its own, without any qualifying prefix, such as density altitude or pressure altitude, means the vertical distance of a movable object above mean sea level. Sometimes it can be referred to as true altitude, in which case it means just the same thing as altitude on its own. Elevation uses the same datum as altitude, but the difference is that elevation is the vertical distance of a fixed object above mean sea level. By fixed object, we normally mean the ground. Therefore, elevation in this case is referring to the vertical distance of this runway above the sea. Elevations can be negative. Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, for instance, is 11 feet below mean sea level and so has an elevation of minus 11. However, elevations do not have to refer to the ground. The top of this control tower has an elevation which will be the elevation of the ground on which it is built, plus the extra distance to the top. This leads on to the next definition, which is height. Height is the vertical distance of an object above a fixed datum. In this example, the aircraft has a height above the airport underneath it. Height is always less than altitude unless the elevation is negative. However, height can refer to either movable objects, such as aircraft, or fixed objects, such as this control tower. A tall obstruction, such as a TV mast, can be quoted both as a height above the ground on which it stands and an elevation above mean sea level. Where height refers to vertical distance of an aircraft, it does not have to be with reference to the ground. For instance, we might be interested in the aircraft's height above the top of a tower. Flight level is something different. Flight level is also known as pressure altitude. It is a pressure difference between that experienced by an aircraft and a datum pressure level of 1013 hectopascals. It is converted using the ISA atmosphere relationship and expressed in feet but it is a pressure relationship and its true vertical distance will vary according to the temperature at the time. Under ISA conditions, that true vertical distance will be the same as the flight level or pressure altitude. Now let's consider the principle on which the altimeter works. We assume an ISA atmosphere with a pressure of 1013 hectopascals at mean sea level. If it is an ISA atmosphere, 10,000 feet will occur at a pressure of approximately 700 hectopascals. 20,000 will be at 450. And 30,000 feet will have a pressure of about 300 hectopascals. These numbers have been rounded slightly, but they are very close to the actual altitudes at which these pressures occur. But remember, these pressures will only be found at these levels on a nicer day. However, it would be very unusual to have a day which is exactly the same as the ISA atmosphere when you fly. 
This standard atmosphere is an average for all the regions in the world, from tropical to polar, and all the seasons of the year, hot or cold. Therefore, the altimeter is extremely unlikely to read your true altitude. This may be for one or two reasons. Firstly, even if the temperature distribution as you climbed were precisely as specified in ISA, the sea level pressure might not be 1013 hectopascals. Sea level pressure usually varies between about 950 and 1050 hectopascals and is seldom the same from day to day. It often changes from hour to hour. So, if the sea level pressure were, say, 970, all the contour lines would move down together like this. And if it were higher than 1013, they would all move together upwards like this. We can solve this problem by altering the subscale setting of our altimeter so that the instrument is reset to read zero for the mean sea level pressure at the time. If the airport were at sea level and the sea level pressure were 995, this is what we must do. If we fail to do so, we have an error, which is given the name barometric error. Now suppose that we don't have this problem. Assume that the sea level pressure is 1013 on a particular day, but this time the temperature changes. Warm air will expand, and the effect is the contour layers concertina outwards. Alternatively, on a cold day, the layers close together, and any given pressure level is found at a lower altitude. Therefore, if we wish our altimeter to indicate true altitude, we must make an allowance for the temperature difference from ISA. This error cannot be corrected on the instrument itself. We allow for it by using calculations or tables. If we fail to do so, we have an error, which is given the name temperature error. So we now need to decide what to set on our altimeter. Should we correct for barometric and temperature error? If we are near the ground and there is a danger of collision into terrain, the answer is obvious. Of course we should. Especially in fog and low cloud. The vertical distance of hills, mountains, ridges and tall structures is given as an elevation on our maps. We need to know our true altitude in order to ensure safe clearance. We must make sea level our datum by setting the subscale correctly. And if the temperature deviation from ISA is significant enough to make a difference, we must correct for temperature error. But what if we are high enough to be in no danger from terrain? In this case, it is more important to avoid colliding with other aircraft. We require vertical separation. This aircraft could be told to fly at 7,000 feet, whilst this one is told to fly at 8,000 feet. However, suppose that one aircraft has corrected for barometric and temperature error at a departure airport, where the sea level pressure and the temperature are lower than when they meet, and has not altered it since. His true altitude will be here. And suppose that this other one has corrected for barometric and temperature error at a departure airport where the sea level pressure and the temperature are higher than when they meet and has not altered it since. His true altitude will be here. There is a danger of collision unless both aircraft use the same datum pressure and deal with temperature error the same way. We have a procedure to deal with this. Once safely away from high ground, both aircraft set 1013 as a datum and do not make any correction for temperature. We call this flight levels. This aircraft is told to fly at flight level 70. This means 7000 feet on 1013. This aircraft is told to fly at flight level 80. This is 8000 feet on 1013. It may be that because of barometric and temperature error, this aircraft is really at 6,500 feet true altitude. 
but if so, this one will be at 7,500 feet true altitude. They are in the same part of the sky and are experiencing identical barometric and temperature errors. They will still have 1,000 feet vertical separation. Their true altitude doesn't matter, as long as there is no danger of either of them hitting the ground. Because of differing requirements at different stages of flight, there are three main altimeter settings in use. These are called QFE, QNH and Standard Pressure Setting, or sometimes simply 1013. These three-letter groups starting with Q come from a code used for Morse messages. Now that voice messages have replaced Morse in aviation, hardly any Q codes remain in common use. But some are still employed for pressure settings, radio bearings and runway direction. QFE is defined as the atmospheric pressure at the aerodrome elevation. It is the subscale setting that will cause the altimeter to read zero when the aircraft is on the ground. The zero datum is the airport elevation, not sea level. Effectively, this gives the pilot his height above touchdown. QNH is the subscale setting that will cause the altimeter to read the airport elevation when the aircraft is at touchdown. Broadly, it gives a pilot his altitude above mean sea level. But this is not the correct definition, because of the possibility of temperature errors. The definition to be used is always the one we have just given. Look at it now and remember it. QNH is the subscale setting that will cause the altimeter to read the airport elevation when the aircraft is at touchdown. Standard pressure setting, or 1013, is what we set when required to fly flight levels. Flight levels are always given in hundreds of feet, and usually only five hundreds and whole thousands of feet are used. Thus, 17,500 feet becomes flight level 175. This is a shorthand way for the air traffic controller to say fly at 17,500 feet on a pressure setting of 1013 hectopascals. It takes less time on the radio. QFE is used for most PPL training. It is easy to understand and it looks normal to most beginners to see zero on the altimeter when you are on the runway. Circuits vary from airfield to airfield, but typically students are taught to start the crosswind turn at 500 feet, fly the downwind leg at 1000 feet, lose some height in the turn to begin the base leg at 800 feet, and start the final turn at 600 feet. If the airfield elevation is, say, 270 feet, it is easier to remember these numbers than the QNH equivalent of 770, 1270, 1070, and 870. Furthermore, if you then go to another airfield where the elevation is, say, 450, it is easier to apply your standard circuit heights than work out new altitudes for each part of the circuit. However, when you depart the circuit, QFE is meaningless. You must set QNH in order to relate your altimeter to elevations, especially if there are obstructions or high ground in the vicinity. QNH is used by airline pilots. Airline pilots do not always use the same airfield and therefore expect to have to familiarize themselves on each flight with the altitudes to be flown on the approach. This is normally done just before top of descent. At a quiet moment, a few minutes before the letdown is expected, the pilots hold a short intercom briefing when they look at the approach chart and agree the procedures that they will use. This is a typical approach chart. This one is for the ILS to runway 08 left at Munich. 
note that the touchdown elevation of 08 left is 1467 feet. This is a plan view of the approach. Here is the runway. Note that the final approach starts at 12 nautical miles DME range from the Delta Mike November. DME means distance measuring equipment. It gives the pilot a range from a ground beacon. Note that we pass over the locator, also known as the Munich Mike November Echo, at 4.7 nautical miles DME range from the Delta Mike November. We also pass over a facility called the Middle Marker. Note also that if we have to go around, our missed approach procedure takes us over an obstruction of elevation 2,133 feet and that there are also several other tall obstructions in the local area. Now let's look at the final part of the approach in profile. Here is the final approach fix at 12 miles DME. The required altitude is shown as 5,000 feet QNH or you could fly a height of 3,533 on QFE. The difference is the elevation of 1467. As you pass the locator at 4.7 miles DME, you should be at 2,680 feet QNH, or 1,213 feet QFE. When we get to the middle marker, we should be 0.6 of a mile from the runway. This is the warning that we are very close to our decision point, which can either be given as a decision altitude or as a decision height. If at the decision altitude we can't see the runway, or at least two bars of crossbar lighting because of low cloud or fog, we have to go around and follow the missed approach procedure. If you remember, it took us over a high obstruction, which we won't be able to see if we are in cloud or fog. We must be on Q&H to know that we are clear of it. As part of the go-around procedure, we will carry out the after takeoff checks. These include setting climb power, raising the gear, setting the flaps as required, and several others to get the aircraft into a cruise rather than a landing configuration. They are vital to safe flight. If we had flown the approach on QFE, we would also have to ensure that the after takeoff checks included a reminder to set QNH. This is a distraction that we can do without when we are already busy. Therefore, airline pilots usually use QNH. It makes little difference to them whether they set QFE or QNH on the approach because they are going to have to brief themselves on the check altitudes anyway. But it means that there is one less thing to do if they have to go around. At Oxford, we teach QNH from the very first flight, because we are preparing students for the airlines. Let's summarise this lesson. We said that we were going to remind ourselves of the basic principle behind the pressure altimeter and to appreciate its limitations as a measure of vertical distance. We would also look at altimeter settings and the reasons for using one rather than another. We defined altitude, elevation, height, and flight level or pressure altitude. We said that ISA was only a datum atmosphere for calibration purposes and was unlikely to be encountered on any actual day. On a real day, the sea level pressure may not be 1013. In this case, we have a barometric error. And the temperature distribution may not be according to ISA. In which case, we have a temperature error. We therefore have to set our altimeter to a known datum pressure and, if necessary, correct for temperature error. However, if we are high enough to be clear of obstructions, we are not interested in our true altitude. It is more important to have vertical separation from other aircraft. 
We therefore set 1013 and fly flight levels. At an airport we can use QFE. This is easier for beginners. QFE is the subscale setting that will cause the altimeter to read zero when the aircraft is on the ground. The zero datum is the airport elevation, not sea level. We can also use QNH. This is generally used by airline pilots. QNH is the subscale setting that will cause the altimeter to read the airport elevation when the aircraft is at touchdown. It is also usually very close to altitude above mean sea level. But this is not the correct definition because of the possibility of temperature errors. When we depart the airfield, we must be on QNH in order to have a datum that relates to the elevations of vertical obstructions. This completes this lesson. We shall go on to consider the procedures for changing our altimeter settings in the next lesson. In this lesson, we are going to look at pressure altimeter errors and we will also look at the effect of blockages and leaks. The magnitude of these errors depends to a large degree on the type of altimeter in use. We will also look at altimeter pressure settings and some simple calculations. The first error to consider is instrument error. Manufacturing imperfections and friction in the mechanical linkages cause errors throughout the operating range of the altimeter. Errors are kept as small as possible by adjustments within the instrument and the calibration process ensures that errors are within permitted tolerances. With the simple and sensitive altimeter, however, the error increases with altitude as the sensitivity of the instrument becomes more significant at high altitude. Next is position error. This error is also sometimes known as pressure error. Ideally, the static pressure sensed by the instrument should be the true static pressure undisturbed by the presence of the aircraft. However, the presence of the aircraft will have an effect on the static pressure sensed and position error occurs as a result of turbulent airflow and suction around the static source. In the example here, we can see the effect of a typical airflow around a combined pitot-static source. Around 90% of pressure error can be eliminated by the use of a separate static source or vent, which can be located in a place where turbulence is minimum. This is usually the side of the fuselage. However, the use of static vents is not always appropriate. In very high-speed aircraft, for example, Static vents are unsuitable because of the build-up of shock waves associated with flight at high Mach numbers. These aircraft are fitted with sophisticated combined pitot-static pressure heads which keep position error within acceptable limits. Instrument error can be established by workshop measurement and pressure error by flight trials and a calibration card is placed beside the altimeter. This is an example for a relatively simple aircraft. The pilot then has to apply the correction by adjusting his indicated altitude. For instance, on this card, if you need to be at 4,000 feet and the correction is minus 50, you fly at an indicated altitude of 4,050 feet. This is an example from an aircraft with a wider operational envelope. These days, the correction would almost certainly be incorporated into a device known as an air data computer, which we will study later. The next to consider is manoeuvre-induced error. Again, this error is related to the source of the static pressure and is caused by short-term fluctuations in pressure at the static source. In low-speed aircraft fitted with a combined pitot-static probe, manoeuvre-induced error is most significant during pitch changes. In aircraft fitted with static vents, it is more significant in yaw, but even so, this is not a very large error.
The fourth error to look at is time lag. With many types of altimeter, the response to a change of height is not instantaneous because of the time taken for the aneroid capsules and linkages to respond to changes in static pressure. This time lag is most noticeable when the change in altitude is prolonged and rapid and causes the altimeter to underread in a climb and to overread in a descent. The problem is largely overcome in the servo assisted altimeter which does not suffer from any appreciable time lag at normal rates of climb and descent. The errors we have looked at so far arise from the design and construction of the altimeter and the pressure sensing system. When using the pressure altimeter, however, there are two further errors which need to be considered. The first of these is known as barometric error and in the pressure altimeter it can account for the greatest error of all. Barometric error is straightforward to understand provided we remember that the pressure altimeter is actually sensing static air pressure which is expressed as altitude according to the pressure lapse rate of the ISA atmosphere. Let's assume that pressure at the airfield's elevation of 275 feet is 995. The pressure setting which the altimeter uses as a datum will be the one we select in the altimeter subscale by turning the setting knob. Let's now assume that the pressure at sea level is 1005 hectopascals. We can see that on the left altimeter the pressure setting of 1005 has been set. While on the right altimeter 1013 has been set. Notice that each altimeter is reading a vertical distance above its respective datum. As the aircraft climbs, we can see that the pressure setting in both altimeter subscales remains as originally set, and the indications on the altimeters will therefore be relative to the pressure datums which have been set on the altimeter subscales. If this datum pressure setting is incorrect, there will be a barometric error. Why though should the date and pressure that we set on the altimeter subscale ever become incorrect? The simple answer is that the local surface pressure is constantly changing. For example, we can see on this chart that the local surface pressure ranges from a high pressure of 1044 to a lowest pressure of 972. In addition, the pressures will be constantly changing throughout the day. And a change in pressure of even 1 hectopascal equates to approximately 27 feet at mean sea level in the international standard atmospheric conditions for which the pressure altimeter is calibrated. So if our altimeter subscale is not reset accordingly, there will be a barometric error. Let's see how barometric error can have a substantial effect on our actual altitude. In our illustration here we have an aircraft with 1013 set on the pressure altimeter flying from A to B at a constant indicated altitude of 4000 feet. We can see that when the aircraft arrives at B the indicated altitude and the true altitude are both 4000 feet. Now let's see the effect of barometric error if we fly at a constant indicated altitude of 4000 feet from A to B while the atmospheric pressure is changing. The aircraft pressure altimeter is still set to a mean sea level pressure of 1013 hectopascals. But let us say that as we fly from A to B the atmospheric pressure at mean sea level drops to 1003 hectopascals. For ease of calculation, let's assume a 1 hectopascal change in pressure equals 30 feet. When the aircraft arrives at B, the aircraft's indicated altitude still shows 4000 feet, but look what has happened to the aircraft's true altitude. It is now only 3700 feet. 
You can see what may happen, therefore, if the atmospheric pressure continues to fall and the altimeter pressure setting is not updated accordingly, especially in cloud or fog. Always remember that when flying towards an area of lower pressure than that set on the pressure altimeter, the altimeter will over-read. Maintaining a constant indicated altitude will therefore result in the true altitude decreasing. The last error we will look at is temperature error. The pressure altimeter is calibrated to the International Standard Atmosphere, or ISA. So, even if there were no other errors at all, the altimeter will not indicate true altitude if the temperature lapse rate differs from ISA conditions. ISA conditions specify a temperature lapse rate of 1.98 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet up to 36,090 feet or 11 kilometers. Unfortunately, the actual temperature conditions rarely coincide with these standard conditions and there is therefore a temperature error to consider. Let's look diagrammatically at the effect of temperature error on the altimeter reading when flying through air which is varying from ISA conditions. Let's start by drawing lines of constant pressure and equate those pressures with altitude. If we now put an area of warm air on the right and an area of cold air on the left, we can see that the pressure levels expand in the warm air and contract in the cold air. Let's now fly an aircraft from the right to the area on the left at a constant indicated altitude. To achieve a constant indicated altitude, the pressure sensed by the altimeter must not change. In other words, we must follow a pressure level. However, in doing so, we are inadvertently following a pressure level which is actually descending. So in reality we are descending also, but the altimeter is not showing this. Our true altitude is decreasing, but our indicated altitude is constant. This is a dangerous situation. Make a note that when flying from an area of high temperature to an area of low temperature, the pressure altimeter will overread or read high. Remember, high, low, high, or more dramatically, cold kills. When flying from an area of low temperature to an area of high temperature, the reverse applies, of course, and the pressure altimeter will underread. There are three main methods of establishing temperature error so that we can work out a safe indicated altitude in order to ensure that we are at or above a required true altitude. The first is a calculation based on a formula. The second is the navigation computer. And we can also use tables, particularly for the decision height or decision altitude case. Let's look at the formula method first. We'll assume that we have the correct Q and H set our indicated altitude is 20,000 feet and the temperature at that altitude is minus 35. The first thing that we have to do is work out what the ISA temperature should be at 20,000 feet and then find the ISA deviation. Click to go on when you've done it. ISA temperature at 20,000 feet is plus 15 degrees at the surface, minus 2 degrees per 1,000 feet. That's plus 15 minus 40. You should have come up with the answer minus 25. However, our static air temperature is minus 35. This is 10 degrees colder than ISA. We can now substitute into our formula. It says that true altitude equals indicated altitude plus open bracket, ISA deviation times 4 feet per 1000 feet times the indicated altitude 
close brackets. Our indicated altitude is 20,000 feet. And the ISA deviation is minus 10. The part in the brackets comes to minus 10 times 20 lots of 4. That's minus 10 times 80. So that's 20,000 minus 800. The true altitude is 19,200 feet. This corresponds to what you would expect. The column of air is 10 degrees colder than ISA. This means that it is denser air. Therefore, the pressure reduces more rapidly than ISA as you climb through the atmosphere because there are fewer feet to a hectopascal with denser air. So you will pass through the required number of hectopascals to give an indication of 20,000 feet in less than 20,000 feet of true altitude. Now let's look at the navigation computer method. For this one, you don't need to work out the ISA deviation. You enter the computer with the static air temperature at your indicated altitude. We carry out the calculation using the altitude window. In the altitude window, align 20,000 feet with the static air temperature of minus 35. There is only one place where this can happen. So by doing this, you have set up a particular relationship between the inner and the outer scales. The outer scale now shows the true altitude corresponding to the indicated altitude on the inner scale. Against 20,000 feet indicated altitude on the inner scale, read off 19,200 feet true altitude on the outer scale. In any calculation, the navigation computer will be as accurate as you need and it is quicker and easier than the formula once you get used to it. Now get your navigation computer out and repeat this scene as often as you need to. Be sure that you are completely confident with this operation before moving on. There is also the table method. This is for use with the decision height or decision altitude. Decision height or altitude is used on an instrument approach. These are usually associated with cloud or fog, where the runway may not be visible until a late stage. If we cannot see two bars of lead-in lighting, we cannot continue the approach. The point at which we make that decision can be either a height or an altitude and, except for aircraft equipped with auto land, is based on the pressure altimeter. Suppose that our decision height is 400 feet. Assume a temperature of minus 40. At sea level, that's 55 degrees colder than ISA. It will make a difference even with a low vertical distance. Look in the table where minus 40 meets 400. This is a correction of 80 feet. So we must use an indicated decision height of 480 feet. We'll now summarize these errors. We have instrument error, pressure error, maneuver induced error, and lag. The first two can be established by workshop measurement and flight trials and a calibration card is placed beside the altimeter. The pilot then has to apply the correction by adjusting his indicated altitude. For instance, if you need to be at 3000 feet and the correction is minus 80, you fly an indicated altitude of 3080 feet. There is not much we can do about manoeuvre induced error or lag except to be aware of it and not rely on the altimeter for an accurate reading when manoeuvring or in a rapid rate of climb or descent. If we correct or allow for just these four and set 1013 and don't apply temperature corrections, we would be flying correctly at flight levels or pressure altitude. The next two are barometric error and temperature error. These are applicable if we wish to obtain true altitude from our altimeter. To avoid barometric error, set the right Q&H and keep it up to date.
And if temperature errors are significant enough to correct, this can be done by using a navigation computer, the formula or tables. This completes the summary of errors which are inherent and are part of the normal operation of the altimeter when it is serviceable. However, there are also failures of the static system to consider, which lead to an unserviceable instrument. Let's now consider what will happen to our pressure altimeter if the static source becomes blocked. At the time of the blockage, the static pressure which was present in the system will be trapped, and any changes in static pressure which subsequently occur outside the blockage will not be sensed. In other words, the blockage will cause the altimeter to freeze at that indicated altitude. It will underread in a subsequent climb and overread in any subsequent descent. How about the effect of a leak in the static line? It depends on whether it occurs in the static line outside or inside the pressure hull. If outside the pressure compartment, or if the aircraft is unpressurized, the altimeter may continue to read correctly. However, on most aircraft there is an increased pressure error which lowers the sense static pressure. This causes the altimeter to indicate slightly high. If the leak is within the pressurized compartment, the static line will simply sense the cabin altitude. Therefore, the altimeter will indicate cabin altitude. It will be useless until the aircraft is depressurized. Altimeter pressure problems are commonly encountered, so to conclude the lesson, let's look at a couple of typical examples. The QNH is 1025 hectopascals. An aircraft is flying at 3,500 feet altitude over an airfield where the QFE is 985. Assuming 1 hectopascal equals 30 feet, what is the height of the aircraft above the airfield? Drawing a diagram often helps, so let's do that. The aircraft is in level flight at 3,500 feet on a QNH of 1025. The airfield QFE is 985. So the difference is 40 hectopascals. This is 1,200 feet if 1 hectopascal equals 30 feet. 3,500 feet minus 1,200 feet equals 2,300 feet. Let's look at another. Assuming the indicated altitude is 10,000 feet with a local QNH set and the corrected outside air temperature is minus 25 degrees Celsius, will the true altitude be more or less than the indicated value? The way to find the answer to this question is ask ourselves what would the ISA temperature be at 10,000 feet. It would be plus 15 at sea level minus 2 degrees per thousand feet up to 10,000 feet. In other words, plus 15 minus 20. This is minus 5 degrees Celsius. So at minus 25 degrees Celsius, which is what the question tells us, we are flying in ISA, minus 20 degrees. We are therefore in colder than standard conditions. A colder temperature means that the altimeter underreads. The true altitude will be less than the indicated altitude. This concludes the lesson. A summary of the main points of the lesson follows. The pressure altimeter suffers from instrument error, position or pressure error, maneuver induced error, time lag, barometric error and temperature error. Instrument error results from manufacturing imperfection, friction and wear. The effect of instrument error in the simple and sensitive altimeter increases with altitude.
Position or pressure error results from turbulent airflow and suction around the static source. The use of a static vent can reduce the effect of position or pressure error. Maneuver induced error is caused by short term fluctuations in pressure at the static source during attitude changes. Time lag causes the altimeter to underread in a climb and overread in a descent. Time lag is most noticeable when the change in altitude is prolonged and rapid. The servo assisted altimeter does not suffer from appreciable time lag. Barometric error occurs as a result of incorrect setting or atmospheric pressure changes. Temperature error occurs because the altimeter is calibrated to an ISA temperature profile. In air colder than ISA conditions, the pressure altimeter will overread. In air warmer than ISA conditions, the pressure altimeter will underread. A static source blockage will cause the altimeter to continue to read the altitude at which the blockage occurs. A static source blockage will cause the pressure altimeter to underread in a climb and overread in a descent.